Thank you very much. And let me thank also the colleagues from Digit for inviting me to this conference. What I'm going to present actually is a joint effort because I consider it as such of, uh, yeah, an interesting story because it started in a local department in DG Connect because there were real business needs to be tackled. And, uh, and then little by little, this tool was taken up. Um, and now it's a corporate tool and it's also, it has been also presented in the, um, uh, in, the, in the last, in 2016 ISA Square program. So it's a joint success story if we can call it this way. Yes, Endore stands for data oriented services. You expected here, I think, a young, a young girl uh, presenting to you uh, something, but it's, uh, Doris is not me. Uh, it stands for data oriented services. Um, a little bit of background which uh, touches a bit on the policy dimension, because after all, these conferences is also about policies. So nowadays, we see an overproliferation, a lot of excitation on the social networks of people uh, that want to, to contribute somehow to the public debate on this or the other uh, policy, or maybe on this or the other referendum or, or elections. And uh, you, you know, it's, uh, it's uh, very well known by everyone now that uh, um, this kind of hyper excitation, we call it hyper connectivity. On one side, it gives the feeling of freedom, you know, of having a say on everything, and of, of, of course, of a kind of a democratic participation. On the other hand, it makes the public dialogue quite unsustainable, as you can, as you can imagine, because it's the fertile ground for these kind of emotional flows that can generate opinions and can influence uh, big polls on one side, and uh, the, the spread of, of uh, disinformation is one of the other phenomena. Um, and definitely, government needs to be prepared to tackle that, because it's about, it's about our future, and many people believe that all of this is also somehow uh, threatening the, the foundations of the democratic process, if not tackled properly. It's not a kind of an alarmistic statement, what I'm saying, but it's important as a government and a public servant working behind to be aware of that and put in place the right measures to, to, to tackle that, uh, that new, uh, new, new trend, that new emergent trend. Um, and of course, many governments at all levels started to, to build their own platforms just to host a conversation in, in a different manner, in a more quiet manner, in a more organized manner. You see the, government, the city of Madrid, just to give an example, or even the citizen engagement has been a leitmotif of, also of, of uh, the French government. Or, so we have platforms at all levels, and actually in the Commission also, we equipped ourselves with our own tools, with the EU survey, better regulation, that is the policy foundation, on that, and of course, all the work that is behind Doris has to be considered also as part of that. So data-driven participatory policies need to be provided with the right tools and the right methods. So, and when the government wants to, 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 to engage with their constituencies and citizens at large, there are different ways of doing that. You can see the social network on one side, so government are present in the social network. They are, this is the common shared uh, place where, where the conversation takes place. On the other, so, but as we said, there the conversation is rather chaotic and not easy to, to grasp. I would challenge everyone to say, let's summarize now what happened in that particular conversation on Facebook or on Twitter, not that easy. Maybe there is someone with the right data analytics tool able to do that, but we as a citizen, as users, we are not that prepared for that. On the other side, you see governments that, for instance, we do it, and that is part of the better regulation, uh, let's say, regulation. Um, uh, we do, we have the obligation each time there is a legislative proposal, we have to put a, a, uh, a survey uh, online and ask, everyone to have a say for at least eight weeks, if I'm not wrong. That will take, by the way, will be the same for the forthcoming digital strategy. We will have to do that, and everyone will have the possibility to contribute. That, this is just great. But of course, 
that type of, uh, of engagement is very structured and perhaps not for, for the layman or, or layperson uh, uh, because it's pretty technical and not easy to participate in. On the other side, there is also the emergence of a new type of approach, semantic driven, and where I think an a discussion on, on, on and semantic interoperability would be, I think, appropriate. Um, like the example we developed a few years ago, that is the future, but it is still uh, online. But of course, there the challenge is also how to find the right trade off between the freedom of, of having a say in whatever form and uh, putting a kind of uh, layer of semantics reflecting the policy making vocabularies. I mean, we speak about the challenge, we speak about the vision, or we speak about you know, a problem, a barrier, a cost. This kind of terminology, which is not certainly for everyone, it would be great that if everyone would be able to, to discuss about concepts that, and, and subjects that on which there is a common agreement, and not jumping from one, one to the other as it happens in the social network, which makes things not easily, easily handleable. So all of this to say that whatever uh, engagement platform you have, the challenge is to gather and to cross-link and cross-fertilize all the inputs and then make sense of it and, and, and to do it rapidly, because when we do policies in every government, we are always challenged by, by time constraints. And so the first step, I think, but that is very trivial, I would say, <clears throat> is to agree on a common data model. Everything can be indeed uh, mapped into a kind of question and answer type of scheme. Even when we make a post on Facebook, we can consider the post a kind of an answer, even if it is not formulated in an interrogative manner. But then all the comments that follow to that, even the likes or the dislikes that you might want to put, they are kind of reactions, more or less emotional, more or less logical, but they are more or less kind of reaction to a kind of a question. So in, in, in general, you can map it in, in, a, in, a, in a pretty simple manner, as you can see there in the table. And, uh, um, and of course, you can have closed questions with the kind of multiple choices, as the one that we have on the Better Regulation EU survey channel. And you can have totally open text question. And that is where text mining becomes crucial. And it, I'll tell you more later in, in a few moments. Um, so that is important that when we, we couple the, the kind of a front end part to engage and the back end data analytics engine, we have readers able to read from whatever source, either by uh, crawling or by, by of course, uh, uh, accessing via APIs. So, and that is basically the way Doris works. So it's a back end to a number of uh, stakeholder engagement channels, if you want, but the most important being, of course, the, the, the EU survey one. And it offers is a kind of a collection of algorithms and techniques, if you want, uh, integrated through a layer of integration. Uh, uh, and I will explain more for those who like uh, uh, more to know what is behind in terms of algorithm tools. Um, and of course, uh, um, a kind of uh, uh, user interface uh, front end that is, uh, that is uh, tailored to the, to the uh, real needs of people. So imagine a consultation with a normal questionnaire that is uh, gathering uh, the no, 10,000 replies. The baseline for us was basically a spreadsheet. So imagine you have to process with a spreadsheet this amount of, of it's, it's like a table with 100 or 50 columns and 1,000 or 2,000 rows. Not that easy to be summarized. So here, there is the first, the first, let's say, feature that offers to the users is the possibility to navigate, to filter, to concentrate and focus on one member states or one type of responder, maybe industry only or SMEs or whatever. So to do a kind of a filtering and the typical uh, filters that you can apply to any data set, even including geographical one. Secondly, normally in Europe, we have 27 languages, even more maybe, and people can submit their answers in any language. So we incorporate the machine ter mach translation at EC, e-translation now into the tool. So you can get an answer in German, you click and you get it in English, and you click back and you get it in, 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 uh, in, uh, in German. Why we did this? Yes, because unfortunately, that's a weak point. 
our algorithms work predominantly in English because the training data sets are in English, in, in natural language processing, you know, and one challenge for the future would be really to extend these training data sets to all languages. You can do plenty of other features, I'll be short here. Keyboard extraction that you can use, for instance, when you, in plenty of other applications than just these. Entity, named entity recognition, if there is someone mentioning a state, a person, or a company, or whatever, the tool recognizes these. And it's very important sometimes because when we need to do the summaries, we want to know if that or the other particular stakeholder made a contribution or not. Sentiment analysis, that's typically another classical, let's say. But what is important, uh, besides also clustering features, what is important is also that it does, uh, uh, offers a kind of help to the typical job that uh, a public servant does in any government. So crunching documents and producing documents and documents. And very often these documents have a kind of particular structure. And what the main sentence uh, extractor does is to identify the initial starting point around which the policy officer will make the summary that will be attached as a, a, an, an annex to the legislative file and then put through, in our case, to the parliament and the council. And it's, that is where our colleagues, our users told us, thank you very much because it would have been a mess without that tool. It would have been 10 times longer. I'm not able to tell you exactly what are the efficiency gains, but I can reassure you that Compared to the spreadsheet, we have a lot here to gain. <laughs> okay, so what is important is also that uh, campaigns are recognized. For instance, in a couple of consultations, for instance, on the firearm or, uh, or made by our colleagues in the GGRO or the uh, common agricultural policy, we had organized campaigns. Not the Russians, I would say, but just uh, uh, maybe organizations that really wanted to push a message and they really bombarded with uh, tens of thousands of very similar replies, and the tool was able to detect it. So just to give you some numbers of where are, what is the level of take up, 24 DGs, more than 50 units have used this tool, more than 120 consultations, and it's growing, and the equivalent of more than 300,000 citizen replies being processed by Doris. Okay. So what is a bit of a few points on the next steps. So we are going now, we started with the one use case, which is processing of stakeholder feedback. The idea is now to use and reuse the same algorithms to take other use cases. So it's not just limited to one thing, but uh, uh, one subject, but possibly also not necessarily in the policy domain, but, but also on the operational side, on the operational side, internally to, to the commission. So indeed, that is a consultation dashboard. One example is the portfolio analysis. So you have a portfolio of projects. For instance, in our case, we have uh, thousands of projects funded under Horizon 2020, FP7, and in the future Horizon Europe how we can analyze the portfolio and see who is doing what uh, on whatever subject, how subjects are related to each other, etc. So that is one. The other one is expert matching. When we are, this is very common to many governments. When you have to create a pool of experts, for instance, for evaluations, well, we tell the CVs on one side, the proposal text on the other side, and the tool offers a matchmaking, let's say, by taking into consideration a number, of, uh, a number of constraints, conflict of interest, for instance, or nationality, gender balance, or whatever. That's very, very much going beyond the data analysis itself as such, but it incorporates also the data analytics, the, sorry, the text analytics components in the analyzing the CVs and whatever. And task allocation is very similar as well there. So what is behind? You can see there are a number of open source packages uh, from Solar to R and Python that implement a number of open source algorithms coming more or less by, by several academic circles. Uh, we have no SQL because with the text uh, is MongoDB on, on, on the other side and for the front end mostly we use AngularJS. But we use also corporate uh, uh, tools 
provided by, by DJ colleagues like uh, Click View or whatever. I'm not sure if I'm allowed to say the details on that, but I think it's important to, to, to share with you the fact that the greater majority of these is indeed open source, and it's based on that that we have put it available under join up. Um, so once more, it came all of these from real business needs. Indeed, long time ago when uh, Ingress Truth is here, at that time it was, uh, was in DigiConnect, uh, there was a kind of uh, betting and say, this is an all regret approach. We invest two FTEs, we recruit uh, data scientists and we see what we can do without too many clear ideas in mind. Say so we start from the technological novelty and challenge and then we will see what kind of use cases will crystallize around. And this magically happened. Yeah, could that maybe be a failure? We don't know. But indeed, indeed uh, the approach was, uh, was a, mm, let's say, a bit serendipitous, we can say, but it worked. And, uh, and we continue that way, basically. So we really incarnate, sorry to use this, this term, the agile methodology really 100%. And we do every development next to the users. So indeed, this is a user, a tool that doesn't come from the, the one person or one team only, but it's really quite a uh, uh, collegial one. Okay, so last slide. I think that uh, that's uh, what kind of future to do, to do with these. We can generalize it further and make it a kind of a service, if you want. So indeed, we have done already the first steps. We created a kind of uh, Doris drive-in where you can, it's, you offer, you expose the interface via web interface. You have, uh, you, you put the data set. You choose the type of task that you want to do and the tool gives you whether the keyword extraction, the name entity, what you have se seen there. So, and it is usable by, by let's say, meant to be used by, by everyone. But of course, this is still in a kind of toy experimental type of status. To do those things at the larger scale, you need the proper infrastructure. You need also to make sure that people that are on the user side are able to use it. So a lot of documentation explaining what, what is for, what you can do with it. So the big challenge indeed, indeed is not on the tool, but is really on the transformation of an organization. And, and, and how to make everyone being a data scientist without having necessarily all the, the type of skills. And I think this is then as a later, later step to be extended also, why not, to everyone. As governments, why we should not ourselves, at least on our data, make every citizen empowered to do their own analytics with the data? It might seem to be, to be a bit too, Utopian kind of, uh, of, of, of a vision, this one, but I think if we really want, we were discussing yesterday on this, to make sure that this great opportunity to, 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 and possibility to that everyone has a say on everything is sustainable, ultimately we need to empower not only by the front end, so, and the, the idea of posting whenever you want, but also the possibility to track and to monitor what's going on. So that is quite perhaps uh, long term, but I think this should be a driving thing for the future in my view. And uh, all of this, just to, to, to tell you that it is part of a greater initiative that is led by our colleagues in Digit together with another four or five uh, directors general that is called Data Food Policy. And uh, that's it. So if you have any question, I would be happy to take it together, of course, with the previous presentation Questions. Thank you.